All right. Good evening, good evening. Congrats to all of you. You've survived thus far, come to the very, very end of the talks at Nauticon. The bitter end here, right? Uh, not so bitter, hopefully. <laughs> 35-year-old Oklahoma native Rob O'Hara has been writing about video games and old computers for almost as long as he's been playing with video games and old computers. Over the past 10 years, Rob has been published in print magazines such as 2600, The Hacker Quarterly, Forever Retro, Video Game Collector Magazine, and Digital Press on websites such as IGN.com, ReviewOmatic.com, and TheLogbook.com, and in books such as the Digital Press Collector's Guide and O'Reilly's Retro Gaming Hacks. In the mid-1990s, Rob co-founded Souls at Zero, the first horror-themed text lit group, and has had multiple text files published by the Cult of the Dead Cow. Rob continues to contribute regularly to the CDC blog, as well as updating his own blog daily at robohara.com. Despite all of these things, Rob feels his greatest achievement has been living in Oklahoma for 35 years and having never owned a cowboy hat or gone cow tipping. Why not? It's fun, man. Get nice and look it up. <laughs> Not the cow, not you. <laughs> During the day, Rob serves as a senior network engineer for a Fortune 500 aerospace company. When not working or writing, Rob enjoys playing and collecting both console video games and coin-operated arcade games. Rob does not like long walks on the beach or even particularly being outside. Bored of writing short horror stories in which a fat guy with a goatee ends up surviving a zombie attack and having a lot of sex along the way, Rob published his first book, Commodork, Sorted Tales from a BBS Junkie, in 2006, followed by his second book, Invading Spaces, A Beginner's Guide to Collecting Arcade Games, in 2008. Over the past three years, both books have sold almost enough copies to pay for this weekend's trip. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob O'Hara. That did not seem nearly that long when I wrote that. Um, my name is Rob O'Hara. Uh, I have a website, robohara.com, robohara at robohara.com. If anybody needs to contact me today, we're going to be talking about the world of free book publishing, basically self-publishing. Who am I? Well, you just heard about it for like five minutes from that thing I wrote. But um, uh, in 2006, I wrote a book called Commodore, uh, Sorted Tales from a BBS Junkie. Uh, in 2008, I wrote another book called Invading Spaces, A Beginner's Guide to Collecting Arcade Games. Um, I was a contributor to the O'Reilly book, Retro Gaming Hacks. I've been on the staff of Video Game Collector Magazine. I've written for other magazines, a zillion websites. So we're going to go back. We're going to start way at the beginning here. As a child, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. And that was a ninja. <laughs> Which, by the way, there are so many logistical problems that that did not work out. Um, first of all, ninja suits only go up to like a 2X. That was a, <laughs> one of the problems. Um, so I had to fall back on plans B and C. Uh, two things I enjoyed as a kid were um, writing and computers. I love this. That is me in 1985. I love that picture. It's like, like the 80s came and took a shit in my room. There's Dungeons and Dragons stuff in there. There's a Commodore. You can tell it's a Commodore because there's like four fans, right? So uh, pretty early on, I decided I wanted to be a writer. I started writing in high school. I started writing um, for the high school yearbook. When I went to college, I uh, joined the newspaper and the yearbook. I was the editor of those things. And eventually, I got an internship at a small town newspaper. And I got a job as a stringer. Um, for those of you that don't know what a stringer is, basically, um, it's a job where a editor puts up a story idea. And like, for example, when the first uh, stringing job I ever took was uh, writing about this parade. So the editor comes in, he puts a sign up, and he says there's going to be a parade this weekend, and all the stringers can go write this story. So all the stringers go out and write a story about the parade. They come back, and they, they file through all these stories, and they throw all of them away except for one. So all those people don't get paid. They take the best story, they edit it down, and for that paper, you got paid 50 cents per column inch. So um, they actually ran that story of mine. It ran, it was about 12 inches long. That's probably the only time I could ever use that phrase. And um, um, so I made six bucks for going to a parade for three hours and then working on a story for three hours. Um, at that newspaper, I also found out who runs newspapers. 
Um, the staff of the newspaper consisted of one editor, one photo editor, and 20 ad people. When I saw uh, the newspaper each week, the ad department would sell all their ads, lay out all their ads, and when they were done, they would hand it to us, and it was our job to fill the white space around the ads. <clears throat> so um, I got out of writing professionally pretty early on, and I moved back to Plan C, uh, which was computers. So when you're going to talk about self-publishing, we have to talk about why people write. Number one, uh, and especially I think this applies to everybody that I've met at this conference over the whole weekend, is that this whole place is made up of leaders. I mean, everybody that I've talked to this weekend, these are all the people that are not following what other people are doing. They're, they're doing their own stuff, and so um, through writing you can share that stuff. People want to read. Um, I put up here feeding the industry. There is a book publishing industry. Books get published, books get consumed. And so by publishing, you're just kind of falling into that. You're not having to, it's not like the music industry uh, or um, like what Drew talked about earlier today, the newspaper industry that's falling apart. There is still a book industry. Um, another thing is like, with all the, I mean, a lot of the, the speeches that I've seen today could be documented, put down in a, uh, I don't know, just explain to people what you're doing. Uh, there's fiction and nonfiction. And basically, the difference is telling a story, telling anyone's story, or telling your own story. Uh, but basically, people write because they have something to say. Now, building on that, I mean, you can write whatever you want and put it on a website, right? But the next level of that is why should you publish what you've written? Number one, it's cool. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been laid for, no, not really. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's cool to just see, you know, this work that you've done, this book, is sitting on a shelf or that you can hand to somebody, you know. Um, it lends credibility to your project. It's not just a, um, you know, some website. I mean, you can stick a website, and there's, you know, GeoCities websites out there, too. So to have this, you know, actual printed document, it, it um, makes it seem a little bit more official. It is future and format proof. And I, I added those tags at the end because uh, I have somewhere around 1,500 audio CDs, and um, I decided I was going to rip those to MP3. This project started like eight years ago. And so, so I start ripping them uh, at like 128K, right? And then someone comes along and goes, you know, that's terrible. You really shouldn't do that. You should be using at least 192 or variable bit rate, right? So, so I start back at the beginning. I start ripping these again. And then, you know, about that time, someone introduces me to AUG format. They're like, yeah, you really don't want MP3s, you know? And so, I started again, and then and now I've been re-ripping everything into flag format. So um, books are going to survive no matter what type of format that we have. Um, they're more accessible. That probably doesn't apply as much to people that are here. Um, I don't like reading books on my phone. I, don't, um, I do have a Kindle, um, which I sort of enjoy reading on. Uh, really, I don't enjoy it that much, but... Whenever I pick it up, I go, Jesus Christ, this cost me $400, and it makes me read on it. But um, uh, not to get off on a, a, a side tangent, but you know, the whole time I'm carrying that thing around, I, that's all I think of is this is $400, so I don't take it to a restaurant. I don't uh, you know, leave it laid around where a book I might. Also, it's, real books are less pirate friendly. <laughs> um, people can pirate anything. People can take whatever work you have and scan it in and, and you know, but um, uh, anyway, so advantages of publishing. So building on that, why did I write my first book, um, Commodore? Like probably some of you, I like old computers. Um, my first real computer was a Commodore 64 and um, I, don't have, I don't have the real estate to keep this thing hooked up all the time, you know. So um, I pull it out of the closet once a year, hook everything up, play stuff, put it back in. And so um, around 2005, I pulled my 64 out, I started going through these disks, and I found that a lot of my old disks were starting to fail. Read errors, you know, I, I, I guess they just, uh, you know, weren't meant to last 20 years. And um, at the same time, I noticed that a lot of my memories, there's this weird parallel, 
that a lot of my memories were starting to fail too. Like I would tell my wife these stories, you know, uh, like about a party, and I would have two people in the story, and then I would realize later that these two people never met, you know. So it was like, just I guess from you know these stories being 20 years old, it was the same kind of thing. Uh, and and then I just had that desire to to preserve those stories, preserve um, uh, that software at the same time. So I started writing down all these stories. I didn't really start to, start out to write a book. I just started documenting these stories. Um, and then, once I had so many stories, I just started organizing them, which kind of became chapters. And, and once I had these chapters, I could just write these little things and connect them, and, and all of a sudden this, this book kind of came out. And I put the Toys R Us up there. Just um, That was one of the first stories that I wrote about uh, when I was, oh, 13 or 14, I guess. Um, my parents took me to Toys R Us and they had a Commodore 64 set up, you remember? Um, they would have it like on the end cap, and they had the keyboard covered with plexiglass, so you could only hit certain keys, you know? <laughs> like you couldn't turn it off and on, but you could just type or whatever, and then you'd go, you know, type little programs on it, hee hee, right? And so, um, so I went up to it, and I typed, you know, like 10 Jack Flack rules or something, and 20 go to 10, right? And my parents are like around the corner. And so I hit enter, like I said, you can't get to anything. You can just get to the keyboard, but inside this thing, there's a monitor and a, and a printer and all this. And right when I hit enter, the printer starts going. And someone has switched the output over to the printer. So now this printer is going, Jack Flack rules, Jack Flack rules, Jack Flack rules. And there's no way to stop it. <laughs> and so I do one of these. <laughs> I mean, what can you do, right? And so I go around the corner, and my parents, and we're, we're going up and down aisles, and then we come back. And now this entire thing is filled with printer paper. <laughs> it's like this huge spaghetti of, of printer paper, you know, filled up. I'm just keep walking off. You know. But anyway, so, so yeah, I started writing all these stories down, and uh, eventually just kind of linked them together through common topics. Okay, so free book publishing. Basically what we're talking about is self-publishing. Uh, the five steps here that we're going to talk about are writing, editing, Publishing, selling, and promoting. And our goal is a total cost of zero dollars. Zero dollars I have in parentheses because and there's a lot of things you could say like, oh, well, he said, you know, make photocopies and that costs money. Okay, yeah. I mean, there are some minor technicalities, but basically what we're talking about is doing all this for free. Writing your book. Man, I was so nervous like three rum and cokes ago. <laughs> The, uh, you need a computer, you need software. There are free versions of basically every program that I use to write my book. Uh, you can start out by doing your brainstorming, mind mapping, whatever, you know, your ideas, when you could start putting those ideas down and uh, to help you organize. Um, I've used bubbles. When I actually wrote Commodore, I did it on index cards. Once I had written down all those ideas for stories, I wrote down little topics, you know, just like keywords that summed up those stories. I set them out on the kitchen table and I just started scooting them around until, you know, I had things that ended up like, like topics. Um, for writing, Google Docs, um, the book I'm working on right now, I'm doing, I'm kind of making it a point to do everything for free in this book, so I'm doing it all in um, open office. If you have graphics in your program, you can use GIMP. It's probably overkill for cropping or anything like that, but, uh, but it's free. And then also there's a, a Scribus, which is a relatively new layout utility. It's basically a free version of uh, PageMaker. <clears throat> Here's some things about writing. If you're going to write a book, you should read every day. That Kindle. But every time I look at that thing, I read. You should write every day. I just read... Uh, Isaac Asimov's book, uh, where he talks about writing. And one of his theories is that once you get into this um, schedule of writing at the same time every day, that ideas will just come to you at that time. In fact, he says, my stories show up every day. I just have to be there to write them down. Uh, you need a place to write and a time to write. This can be uh, you know, in the mornings, in the evenings, wherever, wherever you can get away for half hour or an hour. Um, if you go look at books by authors that talk about writing, every author says the exact same thing. You need to write a thousand words a day.
most authors say that you should write and edit at two different times. There's different reasons for that. One reason is that writing uses one side of your brain, editing uses the other. So if you're sitting there switching back and forth, it's hard to uh, continue to write because you're constantly switching modes back and forth. Um, I do it, but I did so much editing that it's just kind of natural. But you know, leave the big editing for later, write, come up with your story ideas or whatever you're going to do, and then you can go back later and organize that stuff. Sharpening the saw. This is um, one of Stephen Covey's seven habits for highly effective people. Actually, it's the seventh one. That, if you're not familiar with the idea, it's that um, the metaphor is that there's a guy sawing down a tree, and he sawed down so many trees that this saw gets dull, right? And um, so you have to stop what you're doing, go sharpen the saw, and then it's easier to, to keep sawing down trees. And there's a difference. A lot of people say, okay, well, I'm writing on my book. I stop for an hour, and I go back, and I continue to write. Well, that's not sharpening the saw. That's just leaving it there for an hour. So sharpening the saw means basically honing your skills. It could be writing. It could be reading. If you write a blog every day, you know, um, if, I'm sure all of us have like 4,000 RSS feeds that I read every day. So, um, And then the last thing I wrote down here, writing tattoos and opening a business. Um, for me, it's never made sense. People always come up to me. Not always, like not all the time, right? Like twice this happened. And um, they say, um, uh, I want to write a book. And I say, what do you want to write a book about? And they say, I don't know. But I want to write a book. And I, I don't have anything for those people, you know? Um, and it, to me, it's the same thing like about tattoos. Like, I don't have any tattoos, but when I find that one thing, I mean, like, you know, you meet somebody, and they're like, Jesus Christ, they love Pac-Man. <laughs> they love Pac-Man so much that they want to have a tattoo of Pac-Man. I get that, you know. What I don't get is the people that go in and they're like, I want a tattoo, but I don't know what I want, you know. And I don't know, it's just confusing to me, you know. Um, the same thing about opening a business. My wife, uh, she's decided she wants to be an entrepreneur. I said, what kind of business are you going to run? I don't know yet. I'm going to come up with something. You know, okay. Um, but really write what you know, you know. Uh, so here we are. We've done writing. We've, we've written our book, and we're at zero dollars so far. Number two is editing. My biggest regret about Commodore is that I did not spend more time editing. Um, I sent it to a few people. Uh, you'll find that you'll send it to, you'll, if you try to get your friends to edit stuff, you'll send it to a lot of people. You'll hear back from a few people, and they'll miss a lot of stuff. So it's kind of this diminishing returns. Uh, the more eyes you can have look at it, and the more time that you spend, the more stuff you'll find. Uh, if you put out a book that has typos in it, it looks amateurish. I mean, it doesn't look like a real book. When people, typos jump out at you. Spelling mistakes jump out at you. Um, layout design things jump out at you. If you're trying to put out something that looks like a legitimate book, you need to go through it. Um, also, you need to be correct in the things you write. You also need to be consistent. When I was writing um, Commodore, I got halfway through the first chapter and realized I did not know what the plural of BBS was. Is it BBSs? BBS with an S? Is it BBS ES? Uh, BBS apostrophe S, that's technically not right, but it looks right. Uh, or do you cop out and every time you pluralize it, you say bulletin board systems? <laughs> uh, so I, I asked a lot of people. Like I started these polls online and I emailed people, you know, what do you think? And the biggest response I got back was, it doesn't really matter. What, what's more important is that you do it the same way every time. You know, so then every time the reader, it, you don't want to distract away from your material. You know what I mean? So um, as long as the formatting is consistent, that's the biggest thing. I ran into the same thing with the second book, with Sega Genesis. I own two of them, which are Sega Genesi, Genesis, Genesises, you know. In my book, they are Sega Genesis consoles, <laughs> plural. <laughs> Um, editing can be free. Um, if you have an English professor that you're really nice to, they will edit things for you. If you know English majors, you can get people to edit things for you. You can swap editing through Craigslist or through college students. I have edited other people's works and sent them my work. Um, you can also get friends and family to edit things for you. There are things they will tell you. There are things they will not tell you. Um, they will tell you about 
spelling mistakes. They will tell you about typos. Um, they will tell you little things like that. Um, they won't tell you if your book sucks. <laughs> Uh, they tend not to tell you things that will hurt your feelings. Um, they won't tell you things like, uh, there's no market for this book. <laughs> um, they won't tell you uh, if the content is confusing. Um, also, depending on what, you know, it may not be appropriate. You know, like if I sent, like I showed my mom my book about, you know, the technical parts of fixing arcade games. And she went, that's so nice, dear. Not helpful. Okay, so now we've had our book edited. We're still at zero dollars here. And so now we're going to get into self-publishing. Uh, there are actually a lot of advantages about self-publishing. Number one, depending on who you go through, there are either no upfront costs or small upfront costs. Uh, also, there are no agents, no proposals, no advances. Um, the way that most major book publishers work is, um, well, first of all, major book publishers won't talk to you. Um, they don't want to talk to you. They want to talk to an agent. Um, so if you send them your book, they will just throw it away. So you get an agent. Um, he doesn't want to read your book either, actually. He wants to read a proposal of your book. He wants to read a small summary of your book. Um, he will also tell you all the things that are wrong with your book that you should change so that he will you know, send your book on. So you can kind of cut all those people out if you're going to self-publish. There's also no editors and no middleman, nobody to tell you. I mean, if you're going to write some crazy, you know, 9,000-page adventure book or whatever, um, you could do that where an agent probably won't pick that up and won't send it on, uh, on your behalf. Uh, there's also no rejection. <laughs> you can write whatever you want, self-publish it. Whether or not it will sell, that's another thing. But um, uh, you have complete control over your project. So what this gets into is uh, there are multiple. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Number 72. <laughs> Good choice. Thank you, sir. So, um, yeah, you maintain control of your project. You can write whatever you want. And also, money, 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 ha, 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 I'm so rich. But, um, <laughs> which is basically a nice way of saying that um, people who publish their own books um, for small projects will make more money than people who go through professional uh, printing. We'll talk about money here uh, shortly. Um, the worst part about self-publishing is the perception. Um, when I tell people uh, that I self-published, I, I self-published my first book because I had to. I self-published my second book because I wanted to. And when I tell people I self-published my book, they go, oh, no one was interested? <laughs> And actually, there were people that were interested, but um, on the scale of stuff that I was doing, it just didn't make sense. Publishing. This is my next book, Robot Love, here. Top selling genre of paperback books. 50% of all paperback books are romance novels. <laughs> that's why that's the next book right there. It's kind of biographical. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, the top romance novels, right below that you have um, a pretty close race between self-help type books. Um, now you have, um, for a long time, it was mystery, true crime, uh, those type of stories. Now you're seeing more uh, fantasy stuff with Harry Potter, Twilight. Those, there's going to be that for three years now. Um, but uh, the top 10 selling books, number one's the Bible, number two is um, Mao Zedong's book, uh, Guinness Book of World Records, I think, is number four. Um, so if you're writing a dictionary, then number one. Number one. Uh, I think, in fact, um, if you look on, I think Wikipedia's got a list of the top 10 selling books of all time. Uh, the teachings of Mao Zedong is number two at around 90 million. The Bible is number one at six billion. So if you're writing your own Bible, there's a, <laughs> there's a market for that. <laughs> okay, so how does this process work? Lulu.com, and I put an asterisk here. 
Um, I don't think lulu.com is the best self-publishing site. Um, but it is free, so it fits into uh, the confines of the speech. Um, it's also probably the lowest common denominator. It's very simple uh, to use. Basically what you do is you write your document. They accept, they accept PDFs and they accept Microsoft Word. Um, and I found that if you send them Microsoft Word, they convert it to a PDF and it meets their printing standards. So it's a lot easier to let them do it unless you're doing something like a photography type book or something that's going to have real specific layout. You upload a cover. Uh, or you can use stock photography, but you know, uh, I'm, I'm assuming everybody that would do something like this is going to make their own cover. Uh, and once you upload those two things, Lulu assembles them into what they call a project. Once you've uploaded that, you pick a price and you enable it and it's ready to start selling. I also put or buying. So we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. This is um, the cover of Commodore. I've had a lot of people ask me about the, the cover. Uh, I wanted to have something that had the feeling of, of Commodore and, and old computers, you know. So I, I went up upstairs to my computer room and I got my um, box of floppies. And I came out and I dumped them out on the living room floor. And I got up on the couch and I took that picture. And then I got the, uh, the colors actually from the Commodore. Lulu.com's prices. Nothing up front. You can do all of this for free. They have a set printing free, uh, set printing fee that they take off the top of each book, and then they take 20% of your profits. So, for my first book, this is, I don't know why, but people don't like talking about books and book prices, but you can go on Lulu and look it up. So, uh, for a $15 book, Lulu gets approximately $5 for that set printing fee. Now, you set the price at whatever you want. So let's say I, I've set my price for $15. They're going to take that $5 off the top, plus they're going to take 20% of your profits. So if the profits are another $10, they're going to keep two of that. You're going to get eight. Your cost of that is zero. So if you upload a book right now, someone goes online and buys it, Lulu keeps seven, they send you eight. That's it. Um, now, a better scenario, these numbers aren't actually right. They're close. Um, but this kind of, these numbers are for if you buy more than a set amount of copies. Like if you buy 50 copies, let's say, um, the price goes down the more copies that you buy. Um, so normally what I do is buy 100 books at a time. Uh, I'm not trying to get into the printing business. I don't need a garage full of my own books. I mean, it would be cool, <laughs> right? But, um, <laughs> but um, so if you buy your own book, that whole profit part goes away, the, the part that you marked up. Lulu gets their part of the printing, I mean their set fee, which is the $5, and that's all you pay. So I can buy books at that cost and then sell them on my website, sell them however I want. Um, I have them uh, in some local stores. I do them online. I have a, uh, Jason Scott has a thing with the BBS documentary where we have a, a package thing since they're both uh, similar topics. So, so you get a lot more freedom. That's not free, though. I mean, because you're paying for your own book. So, so boo. <laughs> if you're talking about uh, wanting to do it for free, you could do that the top option on there. So, selling your book. If I sell books myself, and I buy 100 books, I pay 5 bucks a book. I sell them on my website for $20. I do priority shipping, so that's five bucks off the top, so I made ten bucks. Um, you can figure in your gas and time. You know, I actually work at an airport right next to a post office, you know, so I can just go over there. But if it's far away or something, I guess you would figure that in. And the middle option is what I talked about before, actually selling your books on Lulu. Um, you can see it's a little bit less profit, but it's completely hands-off. So people go to the website, they buy your book, you never touch anything. Um, once a month, Lulu has my PayPal address, and they say, you sold you know, four million books this month. Or seven. Somewhere in between those two numbers. Um, then you can sell them 
uh, through Amazon. This is not free. You need to have an ISBN number. Lulu sells ISBN numbers for $99, which is high. Um, but it's <laughs> completely, it's hands off. It's really high. Once you have an ISBN number, it goes into, they instantly submit it to, I think they say 13 different online retailers. So uh, Commodore, you can buy it uh, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, barnesandnoble.com, borders.com. It's not in their stores. Um, when people buy my book through Amazon, I make about 78 cents. Because they are, first of all, they're not getting that bulk discount. So it's not the $5, it's closer to $7. And then Lulu tax on a fee to transfer it to Amazon. Amazon has a handling fee of about 450. And then PayPal strips off their 3% of my buck or whatever. So yeah, I make about 78 cents. So if you're, if you, that, why I was saying, if you do a little bit of investment up front, and you buy your own books and you sell them, you're gonna make a lot more money. Um, but what I like to do too is, uh, since if people buy them through my website, I can autograph them. I can sign them, I can I get those people's email address, and uh, it's more like, like we're all friends. <laughs> um, but, so there you go. If you sell them directly through Lulu, you're at zero dollars. Promoting, and this is the big one. If you write a book and you put it out there and nobody buys it, what's the point, right? You have to identify your market, Target your market, build your market if you have to, uh, interact with your market, and never stop talking about your product. Here are 11 free, beginning with our little asterisks, right, things I have done to promote my book. Number one, I run a website. I have a blog. I update it every day. It's robohair.com. I just like hearing myself say my name over and over. It's annoying. Um, I also, uh, I wrote a little subnote in here, be accessible. I have, I get emails several times a week of people that have picked up my book and they want to talk about old computers. That's cool with me. In the back of my book I have um, my email address listed. I have, um, this kind of dates the book, I have my MySpace, <laughs> which I wouldn't put on there now. Um, but um, people want to interact with you, and so um, that's something, you know, you, I mean, I guess you could email Stephen King or, or whoever, you know, but, but that's something that people, that you can give for free. Number two, newspaper press releases. This is a newspaper press release um, from when my second book was released. Big, it was a, a half a page article, big picture of me. It's the best article they have ever run because I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote a press release. I love writing about myself in third person. I wrote this whole thing and I mailed it to them and they ran it exactly like I wrote it. Um, to touch on something I said before about uh, this, this whole industry, as far as book publishing goes, like people wanting to sell books, people wanting to buy books. Um, when you're an author, or when you're promoting something. There's that, that thing in you where you want to say, you know, that initial self-doubt, where you want to say, why would anybody be interested in what I'm doing? On the other side of the city, there's a newspaper editor that has to fill content today. There's somebody looking for a story, right? I, I, didn't, I emailed this to him. I emailed him a, a press release and a photograph, and they ran it, and I'm sure it made his day. You know, he filled up half a page. Number three, podcasts, free. I was going to say I do a podcast, but I did a podcast. <laughs> One of those projects that kind of went, you know. Um, but the podcast starts back up uh, May 1st. Um, I don't talk directly about my book in the podcast. What I talk about are things that people who would like my book would also like. I talk about old computers. I talk about whatever's going on, you know. But I try to, I don't like to just hammer in the book. It feels kind of cheesy, you know what I mean? Like, like sit there and like, oh, yeah, I wrote a book. But, um. But I talk about old computers, and if I go to you know, gaming conventions or anything like that, I talk about that kind of stuff. Um, but I do occasionally plug the book. And I put this little note about here about circular references. And you'll start to see is all these things, they all kind of come together. Like 
on the website, you mentioned the book. In the book, you mentioned the MySpace page. You know, you have the podcast that talks about this. So all these things, you're kind of leading these people all around, and you're, you're building, you know, this group of followers. That sounds weird, but. Book signings, free. Places love to have book signings. Your local bookstore would love to have you in there for two hours to sit at a table. You know, basically, you're bringing in customers to them. I put be creative. I uh, set up a book signing for my second book, uh, the book about fixing arcade games at a local arcade. So they got people in. Uh, you know, so, um, I think I sold like three books or whatever, but I had second place on Donkey Kong. <laughs> Um, if you're going to do book signings, you need to be prepared to sell your book, everybody you talk to, you need to be prepared to sell yourself, and you need to be prepared to repeat yourself. <laughs> you will get the same questions over and over and over. But that's what you're there to do, right? Talk about, uh, talk about your book. Flyers, free. Get creative. I met a guy who wrote a... Um, a book about collecting arcade, uh, like console video games. It's actually like a, uh, almost like a reference, reference guide. And he told me that he makes flyers uh, that fit on a fourth of a page, so you take a paper and cut it into fourths, and he goes into video game stores and he slides them into the racks uh, by the old games, right? So when people go in there and start digging for games, they find this flyer for his book. Um, so I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, going to Walmart and, and covering people's windshields or stuff, but um, and then I put this thing because, not that I would do this, but um, it has been known to happen that people make copies of flyers at work. Bookstore consignments. Uh, you can get your book into chains. Um, you have to talk to the right manager. You have to talk to the right person. Um, but it, you could really get it into independent bookstores. Um, that's my book on the right. That's at the... Um, uh, digital press store in New Jersey. Um, they love to have stuff on the shelf. In fact, what I have now is a uh, uh, reseller price, so I still make some money. It 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 kind of got weird at first. I I didn't really know how to do that. Like um, like were they going to pay me after they sold them or whatever? But I found that this kind of works the best. Like I just cut them a deal and they buy them and they can mark them up and then you know so they make their money later on. Give away the first chapter of your book for free. Um, this works if the first chapter of your book's really good. <laughs> I have the first chapter of both of my books on my website. They're in PDF format. You can go download them, read them. I, um, the first one was less intentional than the second one. The second one, I put a great story at the beginning. I told, you know, it was almost like a setup. I put what the book was about, uh, all this stuff, and then I said, and here's what we're going to talk about, and turn to chapter two, and then there's a link to go buy it, right? Interviews. This is another thing that's free. Uh, feeding the machine. It's the same thing we talked about on the media, right? There are people that do podcasts every week. They're dying to interview people. I mean, uh, so, you know, you could be that guy. I am the David Hasselhoff of Commodore in Germany. I got contacted by this magazine uh, shortly after the first review of my book came out, and these people wanted to interview me, and uh, I actually got the request in German, so I had to translate it, and then we did an email interview, uh, and they translated it back, and eventually they mailed me the magazine, and I don't understand a word of it, but my name, every, and it has like umlauts in there where there shouldn't be any, you know, it's very weird, but, but, um, <laughs> but yes, and then whenever this other German magazine contacted me, and they said, we saw you in this, so I'm huge in Germany, I need to go there someday. Uh, internet forums, free. Uh, on this one, I wrote, be careful, because you can really come off as a douche. If you show up in someone's forum and your first post is, hey, blah, 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 look at me, I wrote a book. People don't like that. Um, the other problem is that you don't have any control. So if you go uh, post, you know, hey, I've written this book, and then they go, well, okay, well, you're a spammer, and then your account gets locked out, and then there are 4,000 responses about, you know, things about your mother and about your book or whatever. You really don't have any say-so on what's going on. And what I did was, uh, my books are about old computers and, and arcade games, and I'm on forums that talk about those things. So uh, what I try to do is just become more active. I join in conversations. I try to give advice and do things like that. 
And um, then I mention my books in the signature, you know, which really works out good because if you go Google the name of my books, you'll go see all those threads and you'll see the signature where it shows up, right? Um, and also I put post in appropriate areas. There are some forms that have a, an area for promoting your own projects or, or things that are for sale and, you know, it's cool to go do that. But, uh, yeah, you don't want it, your first post to be, look at me. Number 10, public appearances. This is me at the Oklahoma Video Game Expo in 2006. Again, I didn't just set up a, a booth about my book. You know, I just, it, it, something felt weird about that. So instead I did a demo about Commodore stuff. I had, there's an old computer there and I was showing like Commodore em emulation and stuff like that. This is at the emergency Chicagoland Commodore Convention <laughs> later that year in 2006. This is at DEF CON, 2007. This is at the Oklahoma uh, Electronic Game Expo in 2008. This is at, oh wait. <laughs> there you go. Take a good picture of me. Sure, yeah, that's going to go in the slideshow next time. Wait till I look smart. You should use your ear cameras way better than mine. Perfect. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll work on that. <laughs> this is number 11. Get your book to people who will like your book, who will talk about your book. My second biggest regret about Commodore was that um, I didn't really, I didn't want to send out free copies in the beginning, you know, like people would say, we would really like to review your book, and I'd say, okay, it's $15, <laughs> those people would never contact me back, right? I didn't really understand how it all worked, um, and I didn't want to send out electronic copies, because uh, I didn't, I mean, it's a, I mean, Commodore is basically a book of all my old stories about how I used to steal software, so sending out a PDF of it is not, you know, it's really asking karma, <laughs> right? I do sell it. Actually, I do sell it now on my website, a PDF, unencrypted. I figure I get what I get, right? Okay, so now we've done all five of these things. Our goal is achieved. The winner is you. <laughs> we have written, edited, published, published, sold, and promoted our book for free. A couple of final thoughts. Number one, you guys are smart. And everybody here at this convention is smart. So when it comes to writing, when it comes to promoting your ideas, really it's just about being creative, it's about finding ways to use your resources that you have, use people that you know. Um, I have promote yourself on here twice because there's two different uh, meanings of the word promote. The first is promote like a job, like you get promoted to a new position. You have to promote yourself into the role of being an author. I put down here, reality is based on people's perception. Like you don't see rock stars come out, you know, and, and they come to the mic and they're like, hello, we just learned this song, and we're kind of drunk, so this won't go too well. <laughs> Actually, I was in that band, but, um, <laughs> but um, so, I mean, if I had, had submitted this speech that said, uh, Rob O'Hara is a guy who wrote a book in Microsoft Word and uploaded it to a site and a few people bought it. You know what I mean? That's not, it's not good. You have to, it, it almost feels like you're playing a part, but uh, it's more than that. You, it, it's just like kind of the whole picture. When you start to believe in yourself and, and you believe in your product, it all kind of comes out that way. And then the other promote yourself is obviously what we've been talking about, about advertising and stuff like that. Um, I wrote Save the Excuses because I've had a lot of people tell me that they want to write a book and then they give me a whole list of reasons why they can't. And they're all things that don't really make sense. Like, well, I would like to write a book, but I have kids. I have kids, you know, or I would like, but I work, you know, I work. So really, if it's something that you decide that you want to do, then you should just do it. Again, write every day. And 
I put part ways with the haters, so I couldn't find a, come up with a better way to say that. Um, but here's a quote from Ray Bradbury. I just read this book, Zen and the Art of Writing. It says, who are your friends? Do they believe in you? Or do they stunt your growth with ridicule and disbelief? If the latter, you haven't friends, go find some. Um, you will have people that will say, oh, yeah, you know, you're not really an author. You just self-publish that. Or, you know, they will knock it down for whatever reason, if they're jealous or they just don't believe in you or whatever. You just can't listen to those people. Um, as long as you think it's a good product and, you know, I've had people that have bought my books and they tell me that they enjoy the book. So, uh, you know, for the people that, that aren't really into it or whatever, you just got to ignore those people and go on. I can't believe I did that in under an hour. I did this two hours last night um, to the lamp in the corner of my room. Questions? <laughs> Wait, I got you. One question I have is why do you write? Is it for the money or for some other reason? Definitely it's not for money. Um, I have always written. Um, for a long time, I um, wrote reviews. I got associated with websites, first with um, uh, this music website called White Trash Devil, which was kind of a joke because it was about heavy metal. So it was like all people who are into heavy metal are either white trash or devil worshipers, right? So I started writing reviews for them. And um, eventually, I set up Review-O-Matic, which is my own website for reviews. But uh, it kind of filled my need for writing. But over after doing it for so long, um, I felt like I wasn't, I, I wasn't doing anything creative. I wasn't writing for me. I was just writing about what other people that were doing was creative. You know what I mean? So. Um, I, I mean, I have people that, that um, I've had several people comment on my blog and say, I can't believe you find things uh, to write about every day. And usually I tell them, I can't believe you don't have something to say every day. You know what I mean? So I mean, if you're just that type of person that, uh, like, I mean, there's, I could go to the store and run into somebody and then that's going to turn into a big story. You know what I mean? And some people are like, oh, I went to the store and this happened. But, I don't know, for some reason, I, I just see uh, bigger stuff than that, you know, so. Uh, Rob, what was the name of that German magazine that you wrote for? The German magazine. I will find it, because I can't pronounce it. <laughs> it's the Scharschaft magazine. Seviak tool right there. Yeah, they have it. If you go Google um, Commodore, you'll find it. They have it uh, available. PDF format. So if you find it and you read German, there you go. So. Uh, besides that uh, magazine, um, I think in your intro there was mentioned you wrote for some other magazines. What uh, can you just relate a little bit about your your magazine writing and, and how that differed from the book writing and the newspaper? Um, newspaper writing was fluff. That's all I ever did. Uh, I, I wrote a couple of feature articles, but for the most part, I got assignments like, um, we want you to go out, find three people, get their name, get their pictures, and ask them what they think about this week's weather. You know, so um, uh, if, you're, if you're looking to, to fulfill any uh, inner you know, satisfaction for writing, that wasn't it for me. Um, uh, so, so the newspaper writing I got out of pretty early on. Uh, I also did some of the AP story rewrites, you know, so these things would come in and, and you would change the words around a little bit and cut it down and, and they would learn that. Um, so then I, I got into magazine writing. And um, magazine writing, at least at my level, um, actually, I, I had an article that ran in 2600 that was called um, 
hacking the PlayStation, which was funny because when um, uh, Emmanuel had the, the big lawsuit with the MPAA and he went to trial, uh, and you know you could get all the, the transcripts of, of the court case, right? And he, he goes on and says, well, our magazine is basically about helping people build things and do good things. And then I guess it's the prosecutor says, I have here this article about hacking the PlayStation. And so I read this and go, oh, my God. <laughs> what did I just get into? Um, but that was like 97, 98, sometime in that time frame. And um, I had always uh, been told that I could write things and people enjoyed reading them, you know. And, but I just, uh, that was really the first time that somebody had published it. So I started going from magazine to magazine. I never did the thing where um, some people write something and then they fish it out to a lot of magazines. I never really did that. I found the magazines that I liked and I tried to write things for those magazines. Um, the biggest problem that I found, at least at the, the level of magazines that I wrote for, was that they had no budget. Uh, basically, the editor may have been making a little bit of money. Nobody else was making any money. So I wrote a, a couple of articles for this magazine called Forever Retro um, in exchange for a free copy. Well, I wrote two articles. And it was for, in exchange for two free copies of the magazine. And I never got the magazine. So <laughs> those are the kind of deals that I broker. <laughs> um, I uh, worked for. Video Game Trader magazine, which actually is a uh, pretty popular magazine. Like, you could get it in Blockbuster and stuff like that. And the deal I got with them was writing game reviews that would run half a page. And they paid 25 bucks per review. So, I mean, it took me maybe a couple of days to write these reviews. Uh, so, in 20, you know, $25, that's like how much Taco Bell I had consumed <laughs> writing the article, right? So, it, I, it wasn't anything that I could make a living in. And, and ultimately, the, um, you get to a point in your life where, uh, especially for writing for me, that I didn't want to write for other people anymore. You know what I mean? Like, if, it, if it's a project and you're contributing to it in some way, then that's cool. But when you, you know, when you see this picture and it's someone who's like, they're the only one making money and they're asking for articles and you're sending them articles for free and then they're making money and you're not, it's kind of weird. You know what I mean? So. Pretty much right now, I'm, I either write stuff for myself or I find people that are all doing something together. Either like we're all making money or we're all not making money. I'm like both of those are good with me. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, thought of something about the uh, have, sorry. <laughs> I just thought about the um, paid author thing. Anybody who does um, writing for like websites or something like that, probably they've been paid for it. Paid professionally, actually. Mm -hmm. So as far as self-promotion, if you've done writing for a website, especially if you've gotten paid for it, um, that's not bad for promotion. That's true. Um, the uh, writing for websites is so broad, you know what I mean? Because you could go register a free blog somewhere and then put up an article and say, hey, I'm a, you know, I was on this website. So uh, you really have to, uh, if you're going to list that kind of stuff on your resume, it has to be something that um, uh, either people have heard of or has some pull. You know, like I wrote um, uh, DVD reviews for IGN for a while. And it paid about like the video game magazine thing did. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, so. I, I've written for a lot of websites, but if people say, hey, what red websites have you written for? There's about two or three that I mentioned, ones that people may have heard of. You know, so. well, it's, I charge probably in the neighborhood of $200 a page. So in terms of actually being paid to do something, it's different than just writing something and then you say, yeah, well, I, somebody, I wrote it, somebody posted it. No, I didn't get paid for it. Right. Yep. I hear you. Anybody else? Is everybody ready for block party? Oh, and NT80. Right. He's up next. Oh, there's somebody very important, and then block party. <laughs> and my song, You Can't Handle the Commodore. <laughs> going to debut tonight, so everybody should come 
Everybody should come. It is my first and probably last rap. <laughs> so there you go. And it doesn't mention my name, so. I know it should, right? The remix. I will put my website in there. Anybody else? All right. Well, that's it. Thank you.